Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. St. Paul exhorts us to virtue in his letter to the Philippians. Virtue. A virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. You know, in the old days, see, I can talk about the old days now. You know, I'm, a, I'm an official senior citizen now, so I can talk about the old days. But in the old days, we used to memorize things more, I think, than we do today. Uh, you have to have a little bit of memorization, whatever the discipline is. Can you imagine, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to drive over a bridge built by an engineer who said, oh, I don't, I don't want to memorize those old boring mathematical formulas. <laughs> I'm not driving over his bridge. Or the uh, physician who says, oh, well, I don't want to have to remember all that boring stuff about anatomy. He's not doing the surgery. You know, th there's a certain amount that we should remember, certainly about our faith. One of the traditional definitions of virtue, and we're going to be talking about virtue in this retreat, this weekend. I'm going to try to do it in a simple enough way. It's not rocket science. A virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It allows the person not only to perform good acts, but to give the best of himself. The virtuous person tends toward the good with all his sensory and spiritual powers. He pursues the good and chooses it in concrete actions. In other words, virtue is of the essence. We've got to strive for virtue. We, we've heard the expression, strive for perfection. Strive for virtue. The goal, the goal of a virtuous life is to become like God, according to St. Gregory of Nyssa. The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. Very often the question comes up. Um, now, us old timers have no problem answering these questions because we learned it the old way, but very often the question will come up in one form or another, why am I here? You know, what's the meaning of life? Young people will often ask that question and some not so young. You know, why am I here? In other words, why did God create me? And of course, we old timers and some not so old. God created me that I might know him and love him and serve him. That I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. Now, in case you have an idea of life other than that one, rearrange your thinking. Because that's the only right one. Why did God create me? That I might know him and love him and serve him. Why? That I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity and there just isn't any other answer than that. And you're wasting your time if you're living for any other reason than that. Now, some people would think that's an oversimplification. And uh, one eminent theologian of the liberal persuasion once branded me a simpleton, which I took as a great compliment, <laughs> reminding him that by definition, God is pure simplicity. <laughs> and perhaps one who tries to serve God would then be a simpleton. That's all right with me. Simple things taught simply. 
That's what teachers should do, you know. All teachers, whether they're teachers of the faith, teachers of geometry, teachers of kindergarten, teachers of doctoral students. Simple things taught simply. The job of a teacher isn't to complicate a perfectly simple thing so that we will sound erudite. Great Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to talk about that. He said he had an experience very early in his, in his career as a professor. He had just earned his doctorate in philosophy. And um, he was working on one in theology, too. And he was teaching a course to deacons. Uh, and I believe it was in London. And he was teaching that course on theandric actions, the, the actions of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And uh, he was a very uh, brilliant man, of course, very erudite, and he had a great gift for speaking. And so he held forth, as only he could, on this very complex theological principle. And at the end of it, one of the deacons came up to him and said, Ah, oh, Dr. Sheehan, Dr. Sheehan, positively brilliant, positively brilliant. Bishop Sheen said, Oh, really? What did I say? He said, well, I don't quite know. <laughs> and he said, well, neither do I. <laughs> and he vowed at that point that he'd never try to complicate simple things. Simple things taught simply. In other words, uh, our business is not to be opaque. Our business is to be transparent as teachers of the faith. What is the goal of a virtuous life? To become like God. Very simple. That's why we practice virtue. I'll give you another reason, a good reason, to be happy. And don't let that one go over your head. Why do we practice virtue in order to be happy? Now and forever. The practice of virtue will make you happy. I didn't say it will always be easy, but it will ultimately make you a happy person, a person with peace in your heart. I'm going to basically do four conferences or talks this weekend, <clears throat> this evening on the human virtues, the cardinal virtues, kind of an overview and then uh, the succeeding three will be on the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Much of what I always have to say um, comes out of the catechism of the Catholic Church. I have my Walmart version of it here. <laughs> I did. I bought it in Walmart. Years ago, when it first came out, they had a mountain of them. I walked into Walmart one day, and they literally had a, a huge pyramid of these... Uh, handy little versions of the catechism, and they had some tremendously good price, like $2.99 or something, and so uh, I, I think I grabbed up about six dozen of them <laughs> and stockpiled them. So a lot of what I have to say comes out of the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's the sure norm for teaching the faith, and I just can't come up with anything better on my own, so I usually just don't try. I rely on it. It's a sure norm for teaching the faith. Who said so? The Pope said so. And I can't do better than the Holy Father. If he said so, that's good enough for me. And I'm also going to uh, rely, especially tomorrow, on uh, the uh, Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas Aquinas, Segunda Segundae, second part of the second part. Classic, classic teaching on... Uh, on virtue. Now the human virtues, we'll start there this evening. The human virtues. Human virtues are firm attitudes, stable dispositions, habitual perfections of intellect and will that govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to reason and to faith. They make possible ease, self-mastery, and joy in leading a morally good life. The virtuous man is he who freely practices the good. The moral virtues are acquired by human effort, 
They are the fruit and seed of morally good acts. They dispose all the powers of the human being for communion with divine love. Practice makes perfect. That old saying, my grandmother was, she must have known every pithy old saying there was. And she must have repeated them very, very frequently because they, they somehow were, and I don't remember, she didn't sit me down and try to teach me those things. They just went in my head because she just must have said them so frequently. It was second nature. Virtue has to do with repetition. Virtue, you know, practice of virtue. A virtue and a vice can become just that, firmly embedded, through repetition, practice. At first, it seems difficult. After a while, it becomes easier and easier, and then, before you know it, uh, if you're not doing that, you're not happy. It's like exercise. Now, uh, how many of us, at one time or another, entered into a regime of exercise. We, we made a New Year's resolution or something. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to uh, do this exercise. And it's hard at first. Now, I had a, this past year, some of you know about it, I had a, I had a health scare um, with my heart. And um, just to, because I, I get asked the same questions quite frequently, I'm fine. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Actually, there wasn't anything wrong with me from, at all. Um, I, I won't have too much time to go into the, that this evening. I've got to stick to what we're talking about. In between, I'll fill you in a little bit, though. Human effort. More, the, human, the moral virtues are acquired by human effort. You've got to work at it. You can't be lazy, slothful. You've got to really work, just like exercise. Boy, I started to, to walk again and then jog. Little did I know I'd be on national television jogging on several networks in the past few months. At first, it's hard. You don't want to do it. But after a while, it gets a little easier and a little easier. That's virtue, and it's also vice. Some of the most outrageous things that you would never think of doing. They can creep in. A little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. Practice makes perfect in that way, too. Uh, people can become extremely adept at vice, just like they can become firmly rooted in virtue. Four virtues play a pivotal role and are called the cardinal virtues. All the others are grouped around them. Now, you know what the cardinal virtues are? Some of these things you, you, should, you can consult with the catechism. You, know, you might not remember everything I said, but you know, look back to the catechism, and uh, you can study. And these are the kind of things you could remember. The cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence. Just think for a moment if you know what that means. You know what it means, basically. It's good to know the definition, though. Definitions are good. Prudence is the virtue. By the way, this is uh, paragraph 1806 from the Catechism. You don't have to remember that. You can, you can just look these things up in the index of the Catechism any time you want. Now, you all have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right? Right. And, 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 it's, and it's all worn out, right? You've used it so much, the, the pages are dog-eared and moth-eaten. The prints almost rubbed off the pages, right? I know. You, you use it every day. That's good. Prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. The prudent man looks where he is going. The book of Proverbs tells us. The prudent man looks where he is going. 
Keep sane and sober for your prayers, First Peter tells us. Prudence is right reason in action. Now, that, that's, a, that's a real good, that's St. Thomas speaking here, St. Thomas Aquinas. Right reason in action. That's prudence. I like that one. You can, it's hard to beat St. Thomas on anything. Right reason in action. He followed Aristotle in that assertion. It is not to be confused with timidity or fear, nor with duplicity or dissimulation. It is called the, char the charioteer of all the virtues. It guides the other virtues by setting rule and measure. Uh, how do you gain prudence, you might say? You know, how, I'd like to have more prudence. Me too. Right reason in action. Well, like all the virtues, practice, practice makes perfect, but prayer, prayer also perfects. In all of this, even the human virtues, all right? Pray. You know, people say to me all the time, oh, I wish I had more of this and more of that, and I wish I had less of this and less of that. I've been working on that for years, and I'll ask them, have you prayed for that, for the acquisition of that virtue? Have you prayed to get rid of that vice? And I just, I'm like a doctor. I, I've noticed that the, the, the longer I go at this, I, I, I have certain characteristics like a physician. You come into the physician, you tell him what ails you, he makes a diagnosis, and then uh, he might give you a prescription. And my prescription is, in many of these cases, look, just say three Hail Marys every morning. Pray for that virtue. Pray to defeat that, that vice. Turn to Our Lady. Turn to Our Lady. Now, I'm giving you a piece of practical advice here. And you'd be very prudent to follow my advice. <laughs> every morning... Do, do a little uh, examine. See where you're weak. Is there a particular virtue that you're lacking? Maybe patience. Hmm? Trust. Remember I said earlier, I quoted what Jesus said, fear is useless, what is needed is trust. Uh, very often um, people will say, I know I have to trust God. And by the way, in case you don't know it, that trust, very pleasing to God, powerful. A, a woman came up to me and said, Oh, Father, I know I need to trust God more. But I just can't see. Would you pray that I could advance in trust? And I said, Well, certainly. And I did. And a week later, she was quite upset at me. She said, You didn't pray for me. I, find, I, can't, I can't trust God at all. Everything has gone absolutely terrible all week long. And I smiled at her and I said, boy, isn't it amazing how God answers prayers? <laughs> They'll ask for humility. They say, oh, I know I have to be humble, Father. I know I have to be humble, but I, I need more humility. Pray for me for humility. Okay. Okie dokie. <laughs> Let's pray for humility. And they'll come back a week later. You didn't pray for me. Everything went wrong. I, and then I can finish the story for them. Of course everything went wrong. God answered the prayer. Do you know what the... How does... If you want to get strong, hmm, you want to have strong biceps, what do athletes do? They exercise their biceps, right? You want stronger uh, legs, you exercise them. You want virtue to be stronger? You must exercise virtue. But very often we are lazy. We don't like to exercise. And therefore, my personal trainer, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> he will exercise us. Do you know what the exercise of the virtue of humility is? It's called humiliation. <laughs> it's got to be exercised or it will not grow. 
principle to remember. Prudence. Pray for it. And think. Hmm? Are we in contact with reality? I am absolutely amazed, looking around the world that we live in, uh, how out of contact with reality we are. It's amazing, a lack of prudence. It's so simple, and, and yet so many people just can't seem to get it. Not in touch with reality. Why? They're not in touch with God. God, by definition, is. God's very essence is to exist. I am who I am. God revealed to Moses on the mountain. God's very essence is to exist. Reality, life, existence. What is it? It's God. Quintessentially, objectively, absolutely speaking. That's reality. You want to be in touch with reality? You have to be in touch with God. How do you do that? Prayer. The exercise of virtue. These things are inextricably linked. You can't artificially separate them. They all go together. Justice. The moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. Justice toward God is called the virtue of religion. Justice toward men disposes one to respect the rights of each and to establish in human relationships the harmony that promotes equity with regard to persons and the common good. The just man often mentioned in sacred scripture, is distinguished by habitual right thinking. Habitual right thinking. And the uprightness of his conduct toward his neighbor. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Leviticus. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The intellect, rooted in truth. The will, rooted in the good, love. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. Our minds are restless, O oh Lord, until they rest in thee. God is truth. Our intellect is ordained for truth, meaning God. The will has as its proper object the good. What's that? God. God. God doesn't merely possess good. God is good. God doesn't merely possess the truth. God is the truth. You just can't be happy until your mind is resting in God and your heart is resting in God. Virtue helps us to do that. So justice. We give God his due. You know, render unto God what is God, unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Justice to God. What's that? That's the virtue of religion. We worship God. We thank God. We praise God. We speak to him. We don't act like he doesn't exist. We don't play like he's a slot machine. Put in a few prayers, hope to hit a jackpot. <laughs> That's not how it works. No. Justice. Justice demands that we give God his due. And our neighbor, you know, justice toward our neighbor, equity. Fortitude. That's a good one. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. 
I've got to repeat that. I'm going to take a little more time with this one. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. It strengthens the resolve to resist temptations and to overcome obstacles in the moral life. The virtue of fortitude enables one to conquer fear, even fear of death, and to face trials and persecutions. It disposes one even to renounce and sacrifice his life in defense of a just cause. That's fortitude. God grant us fortitude. Before I came over here, we stopped at EWTN at the studios and taped a Life on the Rock show that they'll put on in the future. They asked me to come earlier in the week, but I just, I don't have any extra days, so I couldn't do that, so we, uh, on the way here, we taped a show, and um, Father Francis, in interviewing me, asked me, he said, well, trying to bring out the reality of good and evil, you know, or, or, can we ca really categorize life as a war, as a battle between good and evil? Oh, get me started. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, that, that's been kind of, that, that's been the, the, the center of my preaching since I started. How often I've begun homilies, sermons, conferences with the absolute 100% conviction and assertion, we are at war, we are at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood against principalities and powers, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. We're at war. It's a fierce combat, spiritual combat, virtue. Virtue is how you fight this war. I remember when I was in the Army. I enlisted in the Army in 1967 in all the training we had. Uh, we learned how, you know, battlefield preparedness, how to be ready to fight. You had to learn about weapons and tactics, all kinds of things, to be a good soldier. Well, you're in the army. You know, you're in God's army. Like it or not, believe it or not, you're in the army now. <laughs> and it's a heck of a war. Virtue. That's how you fight the good fight and fortitude. Now, as I preach and teach, I am constantly reminded that God has a sense of humor. Otherwise, he could have never chosen me to do this. God knows, and, and, and as I'm preaching, you know, I hit certain things you know, I know that I'm guilty. I know that I'm convicted. If you had any idea how many times I've quit, I'm talking about fortitude here, right? How many times I have just thrown in the towel, given up, said, no more, that's it, I can't do it. Lord, get somebody else. But then... There's always another day. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. We become tired. I don't know about you, but I get tired. And I am so tired after the past year that I, I, some days I want to die. It would be so much easier. Just die. My, I remember my father in his last years and months. He, he suffered a lot. I mean, that, that man knew something about suffering. And I'd be discouraged or disappointed, and I'd kind of talk like that, and he'd say, not yet, bozo. <laughs> you ain't going anywhere. You're not getting out of it that easy. 
How to fight it out. Fortitude, the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties. We have a million difficulties. How many forms they take. How much suffering. Physical suffering. Emotional suffering. Oh, that's a hard one. Emotional suffering. Moral suffering. You know, I run into people, of course, being a priest and traveling as I do, I, I run into people constantly who are suffering. They're dying, you know, cancer, all kinds of things. Um, emotional suffering. I, I think perhaps I've never felt closer to God than when I've been in an AIDS hospice. Cancer ward. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of good. It is not easy to pursue the good. It is not merely a neutral thing. We have enemies. Now, you are all big boys and girls. And I don't have to play any games with you. Because I know that you didn't have to come to this retreat. You had all kinds of other things you could have done. And most of you, my reputation normally precedes me. So I do not have to play pity pat with anyone. I don't have time for that. We are at war. We are at war very much with ourselves. Temptation. We have spiritual enemies. The devil is real, very real, and we're slugging it out. You have to have a real serious measure of fortitude. Uh, this past year, I honestly thought I wouldn't make it. I just didn't think I was going to make it for a thousand and one reasons. Sometimes physical, sometimes emotional, sometimes spiritual, sometimes all of the above. Fortitude. An awful lot of people must have been praying for us. We're still standing. We're still here. I, I wouldn't guarantee another 10 minutes. I don't know. But I know if God is for you, who can be against you? And so you hang in there. Fortitude. How about temperance? The moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. It ensures the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within the limits of what is honorable. The temperate person directs the sensitive appetites towards what is good and maintains a healthy discretion. In the New Testament, this is called moderation or sobriety. Okay? So temperance how do we deal with created things? Uh, now, uh, we live in an age of addiction. I, one of my more popular conferences is on addictions. Whether your addiction is to alcohol, cocaine, heroin, or brownies. <laughs> the dynamics remain pretty much the same. <laughs> Believe it or not. Believe it or not. And the way that we work this out is through the virtue of temperance. It's a moral virtue. Moderation. Learning how to say, that's enough. Don't go there. All of us have certain weaknesses. Now, some people, it may be genetic, uh, it may be environmental, I don't know. Uh, alcoholism, for instance. Some people just have a propensity in that direction. They're, they're strongly moved in that direction. Um, 
some people, it, it might be a certain drug, a drug that makes them high, a drug that makes them low. Whatever it is. Food sometimes, right? Yeah. We all have weaknesses. We're human. We're finite. That's okay. But how do you deal with it? Virtue of temperance. If I have a particular thing, God created me for freedom. God did not create us for slavery. Jesus came to set the captives free. And I don't care what's holding you captive, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, or brownies. If something has power over you in, in that way, if you have an inordinate desire for some created thing, and you can't seem to control it, the virtue of temperance is something. I'm not saying that's the only thing that will be involved in the fight, but it is one thing. Pray for it and practice it. Practice it. I had a particular difficulty that I had, I couldn't seem to overcome it. And I began to pray a rosary every day, asking Our Lady to help me. Just that one day, not to do that particular thing. And, and it took two months. And I had to be very patient with me, which I'm not good at. Gradually, temperance became strengthened. How? Repetition. Practice makes perfect. And prayer. Practice and prayer. The two Ps. Practice and prayer. Practice makes for perfection. And prayer makes it possible. Jesus said, for man it is impossible, for God all things are possible. Every once in a while someone will come up to me. <laughs> I remember one time I, had, I was younger then, and I was recently ordained. And I was coming out of my hometown church. I had just celebrated Mass on a Sunday. I think it was the 10 o'clock Mass. And a, um, a nice-looking, well-dressed, affluent woman um, came up to me, and she said, newly ordained, eh? I said, yes. And she, she shook her head. Tisk, tisk, tisk. What a waste. <laughs> and she, she, and, and, um, and I remember thinking, and I didn't mean to, thinking, yeah, what a waste. Gee, I, you know, <laughs> thank God for celibacy. I could be married to you. <laughs> Talk about purgatory. Well, she, she started in, you know, she really started. And at one point she said, oh, you priest, you're so phony. Celibacy's not possible. You know, we, we all know you're doing something. And I, you know, I said, well, that, that, you know, that's an astute observation of you. And I have to agree with you except for one thing. The power of grace. For man, it may be impossible, but for God... All things are possible. You see, she, she had a, one, a, a way of thinking. People will very often say, it's too hard to be Catholic. You, you require too much. Well, I'll tell you, Catholicism is no wimp religion. It does require things. We have to do things. Things are required of us. Difficult things sometimes. When I look back on what it was like in my... In my teens, through my 20s, 30s, you know, certain things seemed impossible. How can I not have sex, drugs, and rock and roll? No grace, no power. Practice makes perfect. You have a temptation, you say no, and you pray like heck. You beat it once. 
The second time is just a tiny bit easier. The third time, a little bit easier than that. That's how it works. Human virtues are acquired by education, by deliberate acts, and by a perseverance ever renewed in repeated efforts. They are purified and elevated by divine grace. With God's help, they forge character and give facility in the practice of the good. The virtuous man is happy to practice them. It's not easy for man wounded by sin to maintain moral balance. Now, just a note here. I have nothing but compassion for human weakness. There is no drug addict, alcoholic, promiscuous person that doesn't have my heartfelt sympathy. Unlike what some people might think, I am not hard-nosed and hard-hearted toward such people. I, in my life, have been the worst. And I admit it. I have never met anyone worse than me in my confessional. And the old adage, if I can do it, anybody can do it, really holds true. Not that I've arrived. I'm in status viator. I haven't arrived. I'm not in heaven yet. And I know it. And so I'm not going to proclaim a victory. It's still a struggle. But I'll tell you this much. I have been there and done that. I have been at the bottom of the pit totally enslaved to a thousand and one vices. And I have seen the liberating power of Christ through no merit of my own. You know, my, my entire life seems to me at least, I don't know, God, it'll be revealed at the end. We're all going to see the, the truth and the pure light of God. But it seems to me my whole life was a battlefield. And I won some, and I lost some, and I continue to win some and lose some. I have a bad temper still. Now, it doesn't erupt as frequently or as violently as it used to. Well, usually. <laughs> it doesn't. When I was young, Johnny's my name and fighting's my game. <laughs> now, I'm older. I wouldn't say I'm wiser, but I know I'm older. I can feel it when I get up in the morning. A lot slower than I used to. But practice. Practice. That's virtue. That's virtue. It becomes part of us. And the more we practice it, the easier it becomes. And grace. For man, it is impossible. We're wounded by sin. Oh, we know that, that baptism uh, removes the guilt of original sin, but the tendency towards sin is a word that comes to mind. The fomes, the, f the flames, you know, it, can, it, it threatens to flame up, you know, like a smoldering fire. At any time, it, it, it can flame up. You know, oxygen can get to it, can flame up. That's our nature. That's our nature. Although baptism has removed the guilt. If, if you were baptized in a, as an adult, I once baptized a mafia boss on his deathbed. Now, I rather suspect that man had already been baptized. I did conditional baptism. But he thought that he hadn't, and there was no record of him ever been baptized. And he had committed everyone in the book, as he said. And um, all that guilt, that absolute avalanche of guilt, all those sins, was washed away. No question about it. You know, uh, one drop of the precious blood of Jesus is more than super sufficient to cleanse an infinity of sinners and sins. 
The guilt is gone, but what remains is the wound. It's like when you hammer a nail on a board. Right? You can remove the nail, you can remove the guilt. What remains? A wound. A wound. And that's, that's, we're wounded. And in our woundedness, it's just not easy for us to maintain moral balance. We're called to a supernatural end. And merely natural means cannot achieve a supernatural end. In other words, it isn't good enough to be a good old boy. It's just not. Every now and then at a mission, a, a good woman will come up and you say, Oh, Father, my, my husband's a good man, and I can always finish it. But he doesn't like to go to church very much. And then, but he is a good, he's a good guy. He's got a good nature and so forth and so on. That's good enough, isn't it, Father? No. Why not? Because man is called to a supernatural end, oneness with God through conformity to Christ, and it cannot be achieved by purely human natural means. That's the heresy of Pelagianism, right? We need grace. We have to have the assistance of grace to achieve our supernatural end. What's our supernatural end? Union with the Trinity. How do you achieve that supernatural end of union with the Trinity? Conformity to Christ. Our Father has only one Son, Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, the firstborn of all creation. So, we practice virtue. Virtue makes us like God. Virtue is what conforms us to Jesus, the Father's Son. The theological virtues are what we're going to uh, spend most of tomorrow uh, speaking about. And the, the human virtues, the natural virtues, the moral virtues, they all tie in, they're intertwined with the theological virtues. The human virtues are rooted in the theological virtues, which adapt man's faculties for participation in the divine nature. Let me repeat that. that that's from the Catechism, paragraph 1812. The human virtues are rooted in the theological virtues, which adapt man's faculties for participation in the divine nature. For the theological virtues relate directly to God. They relate directly to God. When do we receive the theological virtues? Baptism, right? When we're baptized, the theological virtues are infused into the soul. And you know the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Uh, that, that's one of the things. I'll go over this again tomorrow. And I'll, as I go along, I'll try to recap. Um, educators know that a certain amount of repetition is necessary for the students to, uh, to get it. Matter of fact, psych some psychologists say that you have to hear things 16 times. I don't know where they get 16 from, but research, I, I would imagine, 16 times before it stays there. I will not repeat anything 16 times <laughs> this weekend. However, I might try for two or three times. The definitions, uh, once again, here we go with this business of memorization. I highly encourage you, uh, learn the catechism. You know, go through it the first time. Just try to get the, the major points. Uh, someone told me today, Father, I've been through your catechism series six times. Another one told me three times. Um, the longer it goes on, I'm, re I'm meeting people all over the world. Um, they've gone through that. I'm so thankful we were able to do that series. Memorize some of this stuff. It's so handy. It really can help. You know, would you say that faith is important? I mean, you're all good, you're good Catholics. Faith? Yeah, sure, faith. Mm, absolutely. What is it? Now, there's more than one definition. But if I ask you, what is the theological virtue of faith? Now, I know... I realize that 
you're the pillars of the church. You're, you all would be able to answer this with no problem. I understand, I'm talking rather rhetorically here. Why not more than two of you would not get this right? If I ask you, define the theological virtue of faith, you all know that, not more than two of you would fail to get it right. But for the sake of the two, <laughs> faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief because he who has revealed it is truth itself. Now, that's the theological virtue of faith. And if you go back and study that, think about it, meditate on it, you know, chew on it for a while, you'll really learn a lot. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. You could stop there if you knew what that meant. The theological virtue by which we believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, you believe all that God has said and revealed to us, if you really believe in God. And you believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. Note it doesn't say some of what Holy Church proposes for our belief. Most of which Holy Church proposes for, for our belief. A percentage of which. It says we believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. Why? Because it's plausible? No. Because it is compatible with our millennial lifestyle? No. Because he who has revealed it is truth itself. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. Faith, hope. Hope's the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness. Placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Note that hope is a desire. Theological virtue of hope is a desire. Desire for what? Desire for heaven. Did you know that? If I ask you, what's hope? What's the theological virtue of hope? Would you be able to tell me it's a desire? Desire for what? Desire for heaven and eternal life. Not some lower thing. Do you know why people are always losing hope? Because they're hoping for something less than heaven. That's why. We are made for God. We are made for heaven, and anything less will simply not suffice. And the theological virtue of charity. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake, for his own sake, and love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. Faith, hope, and charity. Those are infused into the soul at baptism. And so we have virtue, power. You know, the root of the word, power. Virtue is power. The theological virtues are manifestation of God's own power. If I asked you for a definition of grace, if I said, what is sanctifying grace? You know, I, I do this to make you think. I ask these little questions to get you in the habit of, of thinking about important <coughs> things. Sanctifying grace, you would admit, is a very important thing, right? Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. That's a simple enough answer. You don't have to come up with one any more complex than that. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. Sanctifying grace is power. Power to become who you are, the body of Christ. Power to become like God. What is, what, what's the purpose of virtue? To become like God. God. Why did God create me? 
that I might know him, love him, and serve him. Why? For the one enormously important reason, that I might live with him in heaven for all eternity. God bless you.